Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Raytheon Technologies Second Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. My name is Tabitha, and I'll be your operator for today. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded for replay purposes. On the call today are Greg Hayes, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Neil Mitchell, Chief Financial Officer, and Jennifer Reed, Vice President of Investor Relations. This call is being carried live on the internet and there is a presentation available for download from Raytheon Technologies website at www.rtx.com. Please note, except where otherwise noted, the company will speak to results from continuing operations, excluding net non-reoccurring and or significant items and acquisition accounting adjustments, often referred to by management as other significant items. The company also reminds listeners that the earnings and cash flow expectations, any other forward-looking statements provided in this call, are subject to risk and uncertainties. RTC's SEC filings, including its forms 8K, 10Q, and 10K, provide details on important factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from anticipated and forward-looking statements. Once the call opens for questions, we ask that you limit your round to, first, to one question per caller to give everyone the opportunity to participate. To ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. To remove yourself from queue, press the pound key. You may ask further questions by reinserting yourself into queue as time permits. With that, I'll turn the call over to Mr. Hayes. Thank you, Tabitha, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm on uh, slide two of the uh, of the uh, deck for those of you following along. Um, so a couple of months ago, we held our first investor day as Raytheon Technologies, and that day we laid out our 2025 goals to deliver strong top line growth, margin expansion, and at least 10 billion dollars in free cash flow by 2025, all while continuing to invest in our businesses and return significant cash to our share owners. We continue to be confident in the future because of our strong franchises, the resilient markets in which we operate, our innovative technologies, and our relentless focus on operational excellence and cost reduction, which will drive margin expansion and strong cash flows into the future. And we continue to see encouraging trends across our market. Our confidence in our ability to achieve these targets remains strong. And as you saw at the end of May, the Department of Defense released a fiscal year 22 budget request which was generally in line with our expectations with respect to our portfolio of products and the investments we're making in differentiated technologies, including missile defense, space-to-base systems, next-generation propulsion, and hypersonics. Major RTX programs fared well overall as modernization funding remains at near historic highs. Requested funding for these programs is favorable to the overall DOD modernization request, when compared to last year's plan for fiscal year 22. It's also worth noting that the overall classified funding request, which supports a significant part of our intelligence and space portfolio, was also very well supported. So I'd say we're well positioned with the administration's priorities, driven by our innovative technologies and capabilities to address the evolving threat of our environment. This is demonstrated, of course, by the significant awards we received this quarter, which included over a billion dollars in classified bookings at RIS and two important franchise wins at our missile and defense business, where we were awarded almost $2 billion for the long-range standoff weapon, or LRSO, and a $1.3 billion for the next-generation interceptor. I think also we should note that the Patriot franchise remains robust, as evidenced by Switzerland becoming the 18th partner nation to select the Patriot air defense system. At the same time, commercial air traffic demand continues to gain momentum across many of our domestic markets as global economies reopen and vaccinations increase. In the U.S., daily travelers throughout the TSA checkpoints have averaged over $2 million per day in July, and that's more than double since January of this year. That said, we are monitoring the COVID variants and the impact on travel, and there's still work to do on global vaccinations and on international border reopenings. All right, with that, let's turn to slide three and just talk about Q2 for a moment, if we can. As you saw from our press release, uh, strong performance during the quarter with sales at the high end of our expectations and adjusted EPS and free cash flow exceeding those expectations that we laid out for you last quarter. 
Strong execution against an increasingly favorable backdrop enabled us to deliver top and bottom line growth on both a year-over-year and a sequential basis. So given our performance year-to-date and the recent trends across our end markets, we're going to raise the low end of our full-year sales outlook by $500 million to a new range of $64.4 billion to $65.4 billion. And we're also going to raise and tighten our adjusted EPS outlook with a new range of $385 to $4 per share. And we're increasing our free cash flow outlook to a range of four and a half to $5 billion for the year. I'm pleased with the strong orders we saw in the quarter, which grew our company backlog to a record $152 billion. And that's a 3% increase since the first quarter. Our defense book to bill was a strong 1.12, resulting in a defense backlog of over $66 billion, and commercial backlog increased by $3.5 billion in the quarter. On the capital allocation front, we repurchased $632 million in shares, bringing us to over a $1 billion in share repurchase year-to-date, and we're on track to meet our commitment of buying back at least $2 billion of shares for the year. We also continued to execute on the merger integration activities. And given our substantial progress and the robust pipeline of opportunities, we're going to raise our gross cost synergy target by another $200 million to $1.5 billion. And that $1.5 billion will be realized in the four, first four years following the merger. That's now 50% more than our original synergy commitment. And there's great execution by the team, but I would tell you we're not done yet. Like everything, there's always more to do. In addition to making good progress on our synergy targets, we're also making significant progress on our structural cost reduction projects, which you've heard about back in our May meeting. We have a pipeline with hundreds of opportunities, including the previously announced actions that we're working across the business. Let me just give you a couple of examples of what we are doing. In our Collins Aerostructures business um, has scheduled over 125 lean events this year, and they're focused on specifically reducing the tack time labor time for the A320 Neo nacelle. We've invested in lean events such as these throughout the pandemic because they've allowed the aerostructures business to reduce nacelle manufacturing time by over 75%. Of course, our normal goal here is about an 87% learning curve. These lean events allow us to exceed that in incredible ways. At Pratt, we continue to build on the overhaul capability and drive turnaround time across our geared turbofan network. The team has made good progress this year, demonstrating a 15% turnaround time improvement over the past year, but importantly, they're on track to drive a 30% reduction by the end of this year. These improvements are the direct result of repair infrastructure development and additional productivity improvements across the network, including the application of lean principles in their shop design as well as automation. Our strong culture of operational excellence is enabled, of course, by the core operating system and significant investments in digital technology and other strategic projects. Altogether, these initiatives will save over $5 billion in cost through 2025. So as you can see, the market fundamentals are strong. We're laser focused on operational excellence, and our key franchises are driving strong financial performance. So with that, let me turn it over to Neil and Jennifer to take you through uh, Q2 and uh, the next and the year. Neil? Well, thanks, Greg. I'm on slide four. As you could expect, I'm pleased with where we landed for the quarter. We exceeded our expectations for both adjusted earnings per share and free cash flow. Sales were $15.9 billion, which was at the high end of our outlook range, and up 10% organically versus prior year on an adjusted pro forma basis, and up 4% sequentially. Our strong performance was driven by the momentum in commercial aerospace and continued growth in defense. Adjusted earnings per share of $1.03 was ahead of our expectations, primarily driven by commercial aftermarket and contract-related settlements at Collins, but also better-than-expected performance at Pratt, RAS, and RMD. On a gap basis, earnings per share from continuing operations was $0.69 per share and included $0.34 of acquisition accounting adjustments and net significant and or non-recurring items. Free cash flow of $966 million exceeded our expectations primarily due to the continuation of better than expected collections and lower than expected capital expenditures. Before I hand it over to Jennifer, let me give you a little color on our synergy progress. We achieved $185 million of incremental gross cost synergies in the quarter, bringing our year-to-date savings to $390 million 
And given the pace that we've realized these synergies on to date, we're increasing our 2021 cost synergy target by 50 million, which brings our new target to the year for the year to 660 million. Collins also achieved nearly 50 million of further acquisition synergies in the quarter, bringing total Rockwell Collins acquisition related savings to nearly 560 million dollars since the deal closed in November of 2018. And we now expect Collins to meet their $600 million acquisition synergy target in 2021, a year ahead of schedule. So great work by the Collins team on that front. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jennifer to take you through the segment results, and I'll come back and talk a bit about the outlook. Jennifer? Thanks, Neil. Starting with Collins Aerospace on slide five. Sales were $4.5 billion in the quarter, up 6% on an adjusted basis driven primarily by the recovery of the commercial aerospace industry and up 11% on an organic basis. By channel, commercial aftermarket sales were up 24%, driven by a 30% increase in parts and repair, a 16% increase in modifications and upgrades, and a 15% increase in provisioning. Sequentially, Commercial aftermarket sales were up 15% with growth in all three channels. Most notably, provisioning, which grew at 40%, and parts and repair, which grew 14%. Commercial OE sales were up 8% from the prior year, driven principally by the recovery of the commercial aerospace industry. Growth in narrowbody, regional, and business jets was particularly offset by expected declines in wide body sales. And military sales were down 7% on an adjusted basis to the prior year divestors and down 1% organically on a tough compare. Recall, Collins' military sales were up 10% in the same period last year. Adjusted operating profit of $518 million was better than expected and was up $494 million from the prior year, driven primarily by higher commercial aftermarket and OE sales, the benefit of continued cost reduction actions, as well as favorable contract settlements that were worth about $50 million. Looking ahead, we continue to expect Collins full-year sales to be down mid to down low single digit, with higher expected commercial aftermarket volumes offsetting slightly less than expected OE deliveries. And given the favorable mix in the first half of the year, the commercial recovery, and the benefit of cost containment measures, we are increasing Collins' full-year operating profit outlook to a new range of up 100 million to 275 million versus prior year. Shifting to Pratt and Whitney on slide six, sales of 4.3 billion were up 19% on an adjusted basis and up 21% on an organic basis, primarily driven by the recovery of the commercial aerospace industry. Commercial aftermarket sales were up 41% in the quarter with legacy large commercial engine shop visits up 56% and Pratt Canada shop visits up 18%. As expected, we also saw a continued ramp in GTF shop visits in the quarter. Commercial OEM sales were up 30%, driven by higher GTF deliveries within Pratt's large commercial engine business and general aviation platforms at Pratt Canada. Military sales were down 3%, also on a tough compare, given Pratt's military sales were up 11% in the same period last year. A continued ramp in the F-135 sustainment was more than offset by lower material inputs on production programs. Adjusted operating profit of $96 million was slightly better than expected and was up $247 million from the prior year, driven primarily by higher commercial aftermarket sales and favorable shop visit mix. Looking ahead, we continue to expect Pratt's full-year sales to be up low to mid-single digit, and we are increasing the low end of Pratt's full-year operating profit outlook by $25 million to a new range of down $50 million to up $25 million versus 2020. Turning now to slide 7, RIS sales were $3.8 billion, up 12% versus the prior year on an adjusted basis. On an adjusted pro forma basis, including the pre-merger stub period, sales were up 6%, driven by strength in airborne ISR programs within sensing and effects, as well as strength in the classified cyber programs within cyber training and services. Adjusting operating profit in the quarter 
of $415 million was slightly better than expected and was up $86 million year over year on an adjusted pro forma basis driven primarily by program efficiencies. The quarter also benefited from a gain on a real estate transaction. RAS had $4 billion of bookings in the quarter, resulting in strong book to build of 1.13 and a backlog of $19.4 billion. Significant bookings included approximately $1.1 billion on classified programs, as well as several other notable awards, including the STARS follow-on award for the FAA to implement a terminal automation system in, in their airports and our first production award for the U.S. Navy Next Generation Jammer Mid-Band System that utilizes RTX industry-leading gallium nitride technology. It's worth noting that we continue to expect RAS full-year book-to-build to be about one. Turning to RAS full-year outlook, we continue to expect sales to grow low to mid-single digit, and we're increasing the low end of RIS's operating out profit outlook by $25 million, to a new range of up $150 million to $175 million versus adjusted pro forma 2020. Turning now to slide 8, RMD sales were up $4 billion, up 15% to prior year on an adjusted basis, on an adjusted pro forma basis, which again includes pre-merger sub-period. Sales were up 9%, driven primarily by higher volume on the International Patriot Program and on Stormbreaker Program, both which included liquidation of pre-contract costs. Adjusted operating profit of $532 million was slightly better than expected and was up $121 million versus prior year on adjusted pro forma basis due to favorable mix and higher program efficiencies. RMD had $6.1 billion of bookings in the quarter, resulting in an exceptionally strong book-to-build of 1.55 and a backlog of $29.7 billion. In addition to the franchise awards that Greg discussed, RMD also had a number of other notable awards in the quarter. We also continue to expect RMD's full-year book-to-build to be about one. Turning to RMD's full-year outlook, we continue to expect sales to grow low to mid-single digit and we're increasing the low end of RMD's operating profit by $25 million to a new range of up 50 to $75 million versus 2020 on an adjusted pro forma basis. I'll turn it back to Neil to provide some color on the rest of the year. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm on slide nine. Let me update you on how we see the current environment as we look to the second half of the year. Starting with our commercial end markets, as I've discussed many times before, the shape of the commercial recovery remains critical to our outlook. That said, we are encouraged by the pace of the vaccine distribution and continued signs of improving air travel demand in many domestic markets. However, we continue to see international air traffic and border reopenings recover slower than we had expected around the world. Keep in mind about 65% of 2019 air travel was international. And while the first half of the year was a little stronger than expected and we're seeing signs of strong summer travel, we still need to see the reopening of international borders and the return of long haul routes to drive continued sequential aftermarket growth in the second half of the year. Looking longer term, we continue to expect commercial air traffic to return to 2019 levels by the end of 2023 with domestic and narrow body fleets recovering before international and wide body fleets. Moving to our defense end markets, we were pleased with what we saw in the fiscal year 22 defense budget request and we remain confident in our ability to grow our defense businesses as we look ahead. Shifting to operational excellence, as Greg mentioned, we're increasing our gross merger cost synergy target to $1.5 billion, and that's driven by higher savings from the corporate and segment consolidations, as well as additional procurement and supply chain savings. At the same time, we're maintaining a focus on implementing our core operating system and driving structural cost reduction across the businesses. And finally, Our financial flexibility is underpinned by our strong balance sheet, which supports our investments in the business and our capital deployment commitments. So let's turn to slide 10. Following our strong first half, we're confident in our full year outlook. As Greg discussed, we're bringing up the low end of our sales range by $500 million, and we're raising our adjusted earnings per share range to $3.85 to $4 per share, or up about 33 cents from the midpoint of our prior outlook. About half of the increase comes from the segments, primarily Collins, and the other half is from 13 cents of tax improvement and about three cents of lower corporate tax items. 
The 13 cent tax benefit is driven by the ongoing optimization of the company's legal and financing structure that we expect to realize discreetly in the third quarter. On the cash side, given the improved earnings outlook, we now expect free cash flow in the range of four and a half to five billion for the year. And finally, it's worth mentioning that we've included an updated segment outlook as well as an updated outlook for some of the below the line items in the webcast appendices. With that, I'll hand it back to Greg to wrap things up. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, so we're, we're on the final slide here, um, slide 11. I just want to reiterate our priorities for 2021. And again, no surprises here. These priorities remain the same. That is, first and foremost, to continue to support our employees, our customers, our, and our suppliers and communities uh, during the pandemic and to keep our employees safe. Our team is dedicated to solving our customers' most complex problems by investing in differentiated technologies to capitalize on our strong franchises. At the same time, we're going to continue to execute on the integration and deliver the cost synergies, and we're committed to operational excellence to drive further structural cost reduction across all of our businesses. And finally, as Neil said, we have a very strong balance sheet. Combining our cash generating combined with our cash generating capabilities provides financial flexibility to support investments in our business and our commitment to returning capital to share owners, including at least $20 billion to share owners in the first four years following the merger. So with that, let me uh, go ahead and open it up for questions. Tabitha? In the interest of time and to allow for broader participation, you're asked to limit yourself to one question. First question comes from a line of Miles Walton with UBS. Hey, good morning. Hey, Greg, you, you mentioned the the GTF um, improvement that you're doing on the cost side. And I was just curious, could you talk about the losses that you're currently incurring per unit, um, how much of an improvement the uh, cost reduction experts are actually translating to unit costs, and then maybe just uh, as you look out the glide slope of uh, losses on the engine, I think the prior com comments were around peaking in 2025. and just maybe size how far off you are from from that peak. Thanks. Sure, Miles. Thanks. I'll take this one. It's Neil. Good morning. Um, first of all, uh, you know, if you think about the second quarter, the uh, Pratt & Whitney large commercial engine business saw a very slight year-over-year -year decline in the OE operating profits. So we're making really good progress driving costs out of the engine in spite of much lower volumes than we had previously um, expected. So I feel good about that. And as you look at the rest of the year, the team continues to drive down the cost curve, and we'll see slight cost improvement year over year, and again, in spite of some significant absorption headwind that we're, we're dealing with relative to uh, you know, today's volumes versus what we were expecting pre-pandemic. Looking a little bit further out, we, we do continue to see um, some upward pressure on negative engine margin as the volumes increase. Um, but we do see that as a positive sign, frankly. Those are investments we're making in the future aftermarket. I'm um, not going to get into quantifying that today, but uh, we do see OE volumes going up in the 2025 time period, um, and the Pratt Whitney team is aggressively working cost reduction actions to contain that negative engine margin um, at an appropriate level. Your next, right, I'll question. To okay, your next question comes from the line of Ron Epstein with Bank of America. Yeah, hey, <clears throat> good, good morning, guys. How are you? Good morning. Can you, can you speak a bit about um, what you're thinking on midterm growth on defense for the business? I mean, we saw in the quarter in particular in Europe, um, foreign military sales for the industry did well. You guys did, you did well with the order um, uh, on the Patriot. But, but what do you think in midterm uh, for the defense business growth? So if we step out a couple of years from now, not just next year, but if we go out maybe three, four years from now. Yeah, I think, you know, it's pretty much what we had talked about back in, in May, Ron, which is, you know, we're going to probably see low to mid single digit uh, organic growth across all the defense businesses. And as you know, that's a mix of both U.S. Uh, defense spending as, as well as international. And obviously on the international side, um, We've seen a little bit of an impact uh, this year with the with the pandemic and the, the havoc that's wreaked on um, on budgets. But at the same time, I think you know, we continue to see strong backlog there. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, you know, Switzerland bought both F-35s and the Patriot defense system. So defense defense business internationally remains good. 
the backlog, as we said, remains strong, over $66 billion at the end of, of the quarter. So I think, you know, we, we easily see that kind of 3 to 5% growth. Uh, or, and I'll, I'll, the midterm, I'll, I'll call it out through 2025 because who knows beyond that. But, again, it's, it's all about having the right technology for, I would say, the next conflict, not the last conflict. And that means having um, uh, space-based technologies. It means hypersonic weapons. It means cyber weapons. All of those things that uh, are going to going to enable uh, us to uh, help the warfighter in, in whatever that next conflict might be. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Your next question comes from the line of Sheila Kyle with Jeffries. Um, good morning, guys. Thank you for the time. Good morning, um, morning, Sheila. So the better outlook at Collins, 225 of it, of the 275 raise, seems to be core productivity. How do we think about what drove that, um, given the top line, it really hasn't changed? And just on first half margins, X the uh, contract settlements are about 9%, and it implies second half margins are 8 So uh, why the contraction in the second half, and how do we how do we think about the improvement off that base? Sheila, I'll start. Um, first of all, I think on the Collins side, the way I would think about the second quarter um, – profit was really driven by a higher aftermarket drop through in part. Um, I'd say substantially it was due to that. Uh, we also did realize about $35 million of cost reduction um, that, that dropped to the bottom line combined with some, you know, about the same number uh, from, from productivity and mix. Uh, so those are, those are really the key drivers. The reason you're not seeing the, the, the overall sales go up uh, for RTX, as you recall, we had a very, very broad range on uh, on the on the sales coming into the year. Uh, most of that range was attributed to aftermarket risk. We're halfway through the year now. We're de-risking that. Uh, we've taken up the bottom end a billion dollars, you know, six months into the year. As you think about that $500 million increase, um, about $200 million of that I would attribute to Collins, um, a little bit less than that to, to, to Pratt & Whitney. Um, and then we also are seeing some improvement on the bottom end, um, you know, probably uh, 30 or so million dollars at RIS and the rest at RMD. So, um, you know, as I look at the rest of the year and you think about the, the margins, there's a couple things I just want to, to highlight for you. We had about five cents of, you know, I'd call it one-time items in the second quarter that I don't expect to repeat um, in the second uh, half of the year. Three of those cents were at Collins, those contract uh, settlements that we called out. We also had about a penny at RIS related to a land sale and then um, an, another penny um, within RMD as well, given some uh, contract, uh, pre-contract uh, liquidations that went through uh, driving about 70 basis points of margin expansion at RMD. So as you think about the second half of the year at Collins in particular, probably 75 to $100 million of E&D headwind in the second half. Um, remember, we have been cautious in terms of the phasing of our discretionary spending. We'll see that ramp up now that we're seeing the strength in the aftermarket. And uh, we had furloughs in place for the first half of the year at Collins. Uh, those are now uh, expired, and so they'll have that incremental cost as you head into the second half of the year. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Your next question comes from the line of Robert Stollard with Vertical Research. Thanks so much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, maybe just to follow up on, on Sheila's uh, question, uh, you did see a very big sequential increase in the uh, Collins aftermarket uh, in Q2 compared to Q1, uh, but it seems like you're a little bit cautious about extrapolating that going forward. So I wonder if you go into a, a little bit more color of what you actually saw in Q2 and why you're perhaps a little bit squishy about this continuing in the second half. Yeah, excuse me. Let, let me let me let me start there, Rob. I think what what surprised us in Q2 was how quickly the commercial aftermarket came back, especially in China and in the U.S. And you, you've heard us talk historically about expecting a typically a six month delay from the time you know we start seeing RPMs recover until the time we start seeing the aftermarket recover. The anomaly this year is the airlines are actually spending money ahead of the recovery in anticipation of a resurgence in demand, which was exactly what they have been seeing. 
And so the, the second quarter was much, much better, I think, than anybody had expected going into this, especially as we think back to January as we are putting the plans together for the year. <clears throat> and so as we think about the, the back half of the year, you know, a lot of that um, pent-up demand, we think, has already been satisfied here in Q2. But I would also tell you, you know, the, the bigger part on college, you got to remember, is 40 to 45 percent of their aftermarket is wide body. And that is the piece that we do not see recovering here in the back half. Again, you'll see some reopenings. We hope uh, some transatlantic routes reopen here uh, in the third quarter and into the fourth quarter. But Trans-Pacific is pretty well still shut down. Uh, the inter-Asia uh, long-haul routes are pretty well still shut down. And so that's kind of the governor, I would tell you, on the back half at Collins is the uh, the long-haul, wide-body marketplace. So, again, strong domestic demand in the U.S., strong domestic demand in China, starting to see some of that in Europe now. But it's really the wide-body that is, uh, I would say, the overall governor on, on the back half. Yeah, and let me, let me just add a couple of other points, too. I think one of the things that was very notable in the second quarter was the 40% sequential growth in provisioning. So, again, I think that's all uh, the airlines getting ready for the uh, expected increase in demand here in the, in the second half of the year. So that's a watch item as we kind of think about the, the back half. On the aftermarket side, and I'm talking Collins in particular, you know, we had 15% sequential growth, as you pointed out, really strong um, growth here in the second quarter. As we look at the the next two quarters, think more about 5% sequential growth. And again, that's off of a higher base here in the second quarter um, and still ahead of what we were talking about uh, back in January. So we're seeing that improvement, uh, but that's sort of what we're calibrating in our, in our forecasting as we look at things today. That's very helpful. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Noah Papanak with Goldman Sachs. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Noah. Good morning. Hey, just in the in the the, def, the legacy Raytheon defense segment margins, um, those have improved notably over the last few quarters. Um, you know, I, I, I understand you had the uh, acquisition accounting reset there. You know, we can see that they were higher in the past before that, and we can see what your future targets are. Um, I'm just wondering how linear uh, that improvement can continue to be. The, the guidance implies they step down uh, in the back half versus the second quarter, but given you know what you're doing on the cost side and given the, the steady recovery from the acquisition accounting input, and again where that long-term target is, uh, it's not clear to me why that would happen. So no, let me try to share a little bit of perspective on that. First, I think as as we think about the first half of the year, the margins um, both at RAS and RMD are strong, stronger than we had expected. Um, you'll recall in the first quarter, I commented on a couple of items at RMD. We had the pension tailwind. We also had some international mix. We also here in the second quarter at RMD had some you know contracts that were awarded that resulted in us liquidating some costs that had accumulated on the balance sheet, and now we can recognize revenue and profit on that. So those those couple of things at RMD are providing some uplift in the first half of the year that we don't expect to repeat in the second half of the year. And at RIS, I pointed out that that asset sale that we, uh, we had in the second quarter as well. If you take that out for RIS, you'll see margins in the back half of the year that are fairly consistent with what we just saw in the second quarter. Now, from a productivity perspective, we are seeing improved productivity, and it's about $50 million each um, in those two segments. So, you know, where that goes as the year continues, we will see. That's a function of, uh, you know, hundreds of VACs being done each quarter. But we are seeing that improvement in uh, the underlying um, productivity uh, in, in a net favorable way. Um, but keep in mind at RMD, as we've talked about back at our investor day, you will see a mix shift in the, the products uh, and the margins um, in the second half of the year as we get into more um, more DOD um, FMS sales. So that's sort of the margin story on the defense business. We're very pleased uh, with where they're heading um, and still see, um, you know, longer term, uh, the targets that we set out in uh, May uh, uh, achieving those. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Carter Copeland with Milius Research. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Carter. Carter. Hey, uh, Neil, uh, just so I can make sure we're all speaking the same language here, uh, when you refer to, to productivity, 
uh, across the, the two segments, the 50 million. Do, do you, are you saying that the gross, or excuse me, the net uh, cumulative adjustments to the EACs were 50 million in each of those two segments? On a year-over-year basis, yes. Net EACs okay. year-over-year. Yep. And is the big driver of that you 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 know you up the synergy target you you realize some incremental cost out for all the reasons you stated earlier and you're just putting that into the ACs and we're just getting that flowing into Q2 because that's when we, we sort of put in the plan. Yeah, that's right. And you know you're seeing uh, sort of that play through and then the natural evolution of us getting further along the percent complete uh, since we had to reset that back in April of 2020. Uh, but that goodness, net goodness, um, is dropping through in the form of, uh, you know, EAC favorability. There's a, a lot of EACs that get done every quarter, and so um, sort of that's the net effect of everything. But generally speaking, we're seeing good productivity um, in both RAS and RMD's businesses. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. You I'll stick to one. Thanks, Carter. Your next question comes from the line of Doug Hardnett with Bernstein. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Doug. Uh, good morning. You know, when um, when you talk about how you're looking at, uh, how you're modeling traffic trends, and like you said, by the end of 2023 for traffic to be back, um, how do you think about your aftermarket recovery in Pratt and Collins uh, with respect to that trend? In other words, how, how, how do you see those lining up on that traffic recovery and perhaps in Collins, maybe if you could break it down by what I would say traditional UTAS, Collins Avionics, and Interiors, you know, that would be really helpful. Well, I, I guess if, if you think about it, Doug, you know, originally, well, our, our forecast would say that we don't see a complete return of air traffic to pre-COVID levels until 2024. We had expected pretty much to, to see, as, as we have historically, that kind of six-month delay from at, with aftermarket recovery tracking uh, RPM recovery. Uh, that's obviously not the way we have seen it uh, play out this year, again, because people have been come back. There's a lot of pent-up demand, and I expect we will see the aftermarket pretty much, pretty much be line-on-line line with RPM growth here over the next couple of years as we see that recovery. Again, I, I think the, the various pieces of the business will, will see, a, I would say, a different trajectory. If you think about the interiors business, for instance, while it's still up sequentially a, a little bit, um, that business is still suffering from the uh, dearth of wide-body um, departures. And so we're not seeing great traction in interiors. Uh, on the avionics front, though, uh, we're seeing kind of a, a normal uh, as expected recovery, the same with, I would say, some of the legacy um, UTAS businesses, as you call them, our, our power and controls business, uh, landing gear, wheels and brakes, all of those things recovering um, pretty much in line with what we're seeing for traffic. So, um, again, I think you know, if I think about the two or the, the weakest link in, in the Collins business is probably interiors, but it will come back. We're convinced that we're going to see wide body traffic recover. It's just going to take some time. And, again, that's a, a relatively high margin business. It's, you know, it's all customer furnished equipment. So that will uh, that will play out into the the recovery of the margins at, at Collins as well, probably into that 23, 24 time frame. Yeah, let let me add a little more color too, Greg. I agree with all that. Um, you know, maybe making some comments about 2021 here, what we see for the rest of the year. And I'll focus on ASMs. I mean, we saw about a 22% increase in ASMs um, in um, in from Q1 to Q2. And as I think about, you know, going from Q2 to Q3, that's probably more in the 30, 35% range. And then starting to level out, you know, call it mid-single digit 5% kind of growth from Q3 to Q4. Getting back to what Greg said, our aftermarket should start to trend with those ASMs um, as we, we look further out through the recovery. Okay, our next question will come from the line of Peter Armand with Baird. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Nice results. Um, hey, Neil, uh, on working capital, can you maybe just talk about the progress you're making on the kind of inventory levels at Collins and Pratt? I believe that's kind of the, the best opportunity for you to show gains going forward. And is there any kind of change here you're thinking on long-term goals and then maybe just expectations around free cash flow cadence in the second half? 
Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm very pleased with what we're doing on inventory of both Pratt and Collins. With the significant increase in sales that we're seeing, um, a known ramp that we're facing, um, inventory levels have stayed, you know, pretty much in line. They're, you know, at, a, at the company level, about $50 million higher than we exited uh, the, the, the first quarter with. And obviously some work to do to drive that down in the, in the back half of the year. Um, as we see the markets strengthen here, we'll be making sure that we have that inventory in place. Could there be a little bit of pressure on that? I suppose, but I'm very happy to see that um, we're still forecasting inventory turn improvements as we exit the year um, and good focus on working capital management. As you think about our four and a half to $5 billion of free cash flow, um, at the midpoint of that range, you know, I'd say that increment comes from the improved profit. If we're able to get to the higher end, that will likely be on slightly improved CapEx, um, and we'll, we'll be watching the working capital. But we got the right focus on it. want to make sure we're ready for the recovery, ready for our customers, but at the same time not bringing in uh, inventory that we, we don't need. In terms of calendarization for the second half of the year, as I think about the third quarter profile, probably about the same increase in free cash flow that we saw from Q1 to Q2. So, uh, again, we're, we're very happy with the collections uh, that we're seeing. Um, and, uh, you know, right now that's sort of how I see uh, third quarter playing out. Appreciate the caller. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. You bet. Your next question comes to the line of Christine Lee Walk with Morgan Stanley. Hi. Good morning, guys. Good morning, morning, Christine. Uh, Neil, earlier you mentioned the variable 75 to 100 million EMD in Collins for the back of the year. Um, can you provide more details on what that is and how much more flexibility you have in deferring to spend? Sure. You know, that that really is across the Collins portfolio. We uh, did a very deep dive last year, as you probably expect, on where we were spending our E&D, and especially through the pandemic, we wanted to make sure that we're focused on the next generation technologies where we can insert our um, upgrades into the existing Collins platforms. Um, you know, I'd say there's always flexibility around our, the allocation of those dollars to specific investments, but it's really in our interest to make sure that we spend the money. Uh, we want to make sure that we do not, um, you know, starve any of our businesses. I think we're a long ways from doing that. You heard um, Steve Tim talk about investing about 6% of sales over the over the next several years, and um, I think our spending is about right. Uh, we're poised to invest about $6 billion of our own money um, between capital and E&D over the, uh, the, each of the next uh, four years. So there's some flexibility, Christine, there, but, um, you know, I do know that we've got a, a long list of important projects uh, that uh, Collins' team is aggressively working. Thanks, Neil. You bet. Your next question comes to the line of David Strauss with Barclays. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Hey, David. Um, Neil, you highlighted the um, the sequential ASK growth that you're expecting in Q3. I guess um, in light of that, maybe talk about what you're seeing so far in terms of July uh, on the aftermarket side, and then Greg. Um, you know, since the investor day, Airbus came out with uh, much higher potential narrowbody production rates as we look out to 23, 24, 25. Um, I guess, what do you think of those potential rates, and how could that uh, change what you've guided uh, Collins and Pratt to look like in uh, out in 2025? Thanks. Sure, I'll start. You know. Obviously, um, you know, we haven't even closed the month of July yet, but we do look at that uh, data uh, regularly. We're seeing continued um, uh, growth as we, um, you know, head into July, consistent with the forecast that we've got baked into our outlook. Um, you know, what I would say um, as we think about um, Pratt, for example, you know, I think a big piece of the second half is in the shop visits. Uh, we were really happy to see 56% year-over-year uh, large Legacy shop visits, um, as I think about um, Q3, will be probably north of 30, 35%, um, and even over 20% growth year over year in the fourth quarter. So some good indicators there. We've got pretty good line of sight um, as we look at the, the back half of the year, uh, particularly on the Pratt shop visit side. So, you know, David, as we, as we think about um, 
the narrow body uh, ramp, if you will. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see both Boeing and, Air, and Airbus are starting to ramp up production. Uh, we were a little surprised, I would tell you, but uh, we have been talking to Airbus. I, I know uh, Guillaume and company are, are, are laser focused on uh, trying to take some market share, and so they're, they're being pretty aggressive by showing that 70 to 75 uh, aircraft a month uh, figure out in 2025. I would tell you, while we're working with Airbus, um, you know, that remains a challenge to, for us to get to those levels. Right now we're capacitized to, I think it was rate 63, was the, was the latest high point. Um, obviously, um, it, we will do whatever we need to to support our customers. Um, now, whether or not that, that rate actually materializes, I guess, will be the question. Uh, obviously, with the XLR coming along as the A321 XLR, I think Airbus got a great aircraft, and uh, they want to take advantage of that uh, in the marketplace. But we'll see. Um, again, as, as I think about this, the you know, air traffic is going to grow 4 or 5% a year. Um, so you're going to continue to see plenty of demand out there for narrow body. And the question will be, is it A320s or is it 737s? Uh, we're positioned on both. Uh, obviously, a little bit different content on the A320 with the, with the NEO engines. But, um, you know, we're, we're keeping an eye on all of this. And I think, you know, we'll work with the supply chain. Uh, we'll make sure that we're adequately capacitized to be able to serve our customer there. And uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, there's, there's plenty of time uh, between now and then to, to get ready if, if the ramp actually uh, occurs as, as quickly as what Airbus hopes. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from the line of Robert Spingarn with Credit Suisse. Hi, good morning. You know, good Greg, morning. you talked about the um the surprising second quarter narrow body aftermarket demand and you also talked about the lagging wide body recovery but maybe a year from now or even sooner if we end up with uh, the vaccines getting traction and we see more long haul traffic strength could we have a surge in demand both for maybe wide body and narrow body at the same time and and you know given the headcount reductions do you have the capacity to address it in other words could the demand curve turn into a sine wave at some point here? <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> I think, in, in fact, you know, we are optimistic that we could see a faster recovery should we get um, a, a more a robust uh, vaccine rollout. You know, keep in mind, you know, in the U.S., about half of the population is, is vaccinated. It's getting to be the same in Europe. China uh, vaccine is, is, is also taking hold. But you know, globally, it's only about 9%. So you, we've got a long way to go, I think. The good news is most of the air traffic, of course, is, is, is between China and the U.S. and, and Europe. So we could see a, a, a quicker recovery. I would tell you that the, we are more than adequately capacitized to take advantage of that recovery from an aftermarket perspective. You know, as we took all those cost cuts last year, that kind of you know, $2 billion of, of cost takeout, what we didn't do was close a lot of factories or eliminate a lot of capacity. As Neil mentioned before, one of the overhangs, of course, in, in, at Pratt, uh, from a cost standpoint, is you got all this unabsorbed overhead. Well, that's because we still have the facilities. We can, we're still facilitized to do a thousand uh, Vs if we, if, if we saw the, that kind of a ramp. You know, this year we'll probably do 550 Vs uh, overhauls, but you know, the capacity still exists. It's the same on the GTF. And it's really the same across the Collins portfolio. We haven't closed factories, uh, and we can bring folks uh, back. We can work uh, extra shifts to, to pick up on the demand. So I'm not actually worried um, if uh, we were to see that kind of a recovery. It would be, it would be good. Uh, certainly not what we expect today, but uh, we are ready for it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Seth Seifman with J.P. Morgan. Hey, uh, thanks very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> Greg, I was wondering if you could maybe put on your uh, business roundtable hat and uh, talk a little bit about we're, you know, getting into the second half of the year, and, um, you know, there's still no resolution on the uh, R&D tax issue for next year. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk about, A, the prospects for that in the Congress, um, and, and, B, the prospects to um, get some relief from that outside of Congress, maybe with some kind of um, IRS interpretation of the law that removes um, customer-funded R&D from the, from the equation? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Seth. As, as, we, as we were very hopeful, I would say, 
three or four months ago as we were thinking about the infrastructure bill as it was winding its way through Congress. Uh, and clearly, as we were having discussions on the Hill, um, both the Senate and the, and the House side, people are very sympathetic to the fact that this R&D uh, amortization language that was in the 2017 Jobs Act uh, is not helpful in terms of uh, driving the kind of investments that we want to see in technology. And so we have, we have been pressing folks to include uh, relief on the R&D um, amortization uh, formula, um, in any infrastructure bill that, that's out there. Obviously, there's pressure to take the corporate rate up. We'll see where that goes. But um, I think we're still hopeful that we will see a some type of a relief. And maybe it comes in December, as, as is typical with the, the tax extenders, uh, that we get some relief here. It's just hard to imagine you want to stop folks from investing in R&D as the, as the economy comes back from the pandemic. So, Again, we're, we're still hopeful. Uh, folks at Business Roundtable are doing a good job educating the, uh, the Congress on this, and uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. But we're not going to give up hope. I think there's, this is something we just have to get done. Right. And anything outside of Congress? You know, I, we haven't actually explored a regulatory ruling. I haven't seen a pathway for uh, IRS or Treasury to – to change the, the statutory language of the 2017 Jobs Act. So right now, I think it's going to require an act of Congress. Great. Thank you very much. Yes. Your next question comes to the line of Kai Van Rumer with Cowan. Yes, uh, thanks so much. So could you comment on uh, BizJet uh, trends at Legacy UTX? And and also, you know, you didn't have much of an uptick in commercial OE at Collins. What do you see going forward for the pickup in rates on the MAX and the 787 where Boeing's been having their own problems? Thanks. Yeah, let me start with some BizJet context. Kai, how are you doing today? Um, you know, obviously BizJet has rebounded very quickly. And so, you know, whether that's um, at the, you know, affecting the Collins business or, the Pratt Canada business, we're seeing, you know, very good performance there. That, I'd say, combined with general aviation, both are at or near or even slightly above where we were in 2019. So that is a major contributor here uh, to part of the Collins, um, you know, Q2 performance. We're seeing it within the Pratt aftermarket as well. Um, as I think about OE, uh, we're certainly uh, seeing that OE growth at, at both Collins and Pratt. Um, and as I think about you know, the, the back half of the year, we will start to see 737 MAX um, start to be a, a bigger contributor. We had talked about um, being aligned with, with Boeing's production schedule, but having delivered, you know, about a third of their requirements for this year already. And so as we pick up on that, that uh, second third, if you will, or two-thirds rather, um, that will start to ramp up um, as we go through the third quarter and, and more heavily into the fourth quarter. And then, of course, another step as we get into 22, which we'll, we'll talk more about later in the fall. Yes, you, know, you always see picked up also, Kai, on the um, on 787. You know, that's down to, I think, five a month. In fact, it's because of some of these production delays, we think it might be even a little bit slower than that. So there's, a, there's some impact there. You, re, you recall uh, revenue on that's about $10 million a ship set for the Collins business. So um, there, there, there is a little bit of a... Uh, a governor, I would say, on, on Collins OE, um, even here into the third quarter. Now, we expect, again, as, as Neil said, when 737 production rates pick up or, or pick up uh, here, as well as uh, we get some of these production issues behind us at the at the Boeing line uh, on 787, that should, that should help uh, towards the end of the year and into next year. Thank you. Your next question comes to the line of Mike Majeri with Wolf Research. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the time. Um, Greg, you mentioned having the right technology for the next conflict. So can you talk about the longer-term sort of supply-demand balance in your missile business as the DOD customer's priorities shift back towards peer adversaries um, from asymmetric threats? Yeah, you know, Mike, that's, a, that's an interesting discussion. If you, if you think about what the, as I, we, we talk about having the right technologies for the next conflict, um, as, as we see this, right, the, the next war, and I've said this before, it, it gets fought in cyberspace and outer space initially. 
Uh, you aren't going to see uh, land wars in Asia or um, tank battles across Europe. Uh, what you are going to see is, is cyber uh, attacks. Uh, you're going to see um, what, you're going to see attacks against uh, strategic assets in space to uh, compromise communications and sensing systems. And being able to defend those assets, being able to project uh, or, and to replenish those, those assets is really what we're focused on uh, across the, uh, the, the RTX portfolio. You know, the other piece of this, of course, is how do you have uh, assured communications? And you, know, you hear a lot about JADC2, this Joint All Demand command, command and Control. You know, having assured communications, having reliable, replenishable comm systems is also part of this. And again, we play in that uh, really across the, the business from the sensing systems at, at RMD to the processing that we do at RIS to some of the communication systems that come out of Collins. Um, we think we were uniquely positioned there as well. So, um, I, look, it's a, it's a complex uh, battlefield um, as, as we think about it. There's no one single answer. Um, it's not like we're going to replace all of the missiles we have with high-powered microwaves or high-powered lasers. It's going to be a layered defense where you're going to still ha you're still going to see SM3s and SM6s, and you're still going to need AMRAM missiles, uh, as well as uh, some things to deal with, I would say, the, the emerging threat of hypersonics, which we think is primarily going to be um, high-powered microwaves. So um, a lot of, lot to, to pull apart there, but I think, again, we've, we have technologies in all of those spaces that can differentiate us. Thank you. And our last question will come from the line of Matt Eggers with Wells Fargo. Thanks. Good morning. Um, could you just touch on the sort of the military engine outlook? Uh, and wondering kind of specifically in light of, you know, some of the F-35 uh, kind of disruptions we've seen on the aircraft side last year and this year, and, you know, Lockheed's comments about maybe a little bit of a slower uh, a growth profile here going forward. Just how we should think about that kind of kind of trending going forward. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, you know, as we look at the rest of the year for Pratt on the military engine business, pretty steady. You know, we're, you know, at or near, you know, sort of the rate we need to be on the F-135 engine. Um, and, you know, we're clipping along. Uh, we're not quite halfway through our delivery schedule for the year, but we're pretty close to it. So I'd expect the back half of our year to look pretty similar to what the first half did in terms of engine deliveries. And as we've talked in the past, we pretty much see that kind of rate uh, holding steady for uh, the foreseeable future there. Yeah, and keep in mind, too, um, Matt, it's not just F-35, right? We're also on the KC-46, the tanker. Um, we're going to be on the next generation B-21 um, as that uh, goes into flight test and then into production in the next couple of years. So there is more than just JSF out there. And the F-100 on the F-16 remains uh, opportun opportunities for us to, to continue to uh, to uh, utilize a platform that literally is 40 years old. So um, there's more to the military engine business than just uh, JSF. Obviously, it's the biggest piece, but the, those other pieces are important as well. Got it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening in today. As always, Jennifer and team are prepared and ready to take all of your, your questions. So thanks for listening in, and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Take care and be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That quiz is conference call. You may now disconnect.